Thank you for having me. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, I will mumble a little bit. Um, and uh, I would like to begin with several thoughts I'd, uh, about Etel I've been thinking about over the last couple of years. Um, I would like to begin with a narrative, a bit strange perhaps, um, in which the Nigerian-American Chris Abani uh, narrated uh, on stage once that he was uh, a participant in the Struga uh, uh, Golden Wreath Festival um, years ago where, when they honored Mahmoud Darwish. And there was, uh, he, he, he says, Chris says, that there was noise in the back of this um, event place. And uh, he was really, uh, you know, he came up to Darwish and he said, it was an amazing reading. How, how, how did you like not be bothered by the noise behind? And, uh, and Darwish said, uh, oh, you know, I love poetry so much. It's, we're here to honor poetry, not to be bothered by extraneous noises. And, you know, Chris said a few kind words to Darwish and Darwish turned to him and said, thank you, my Arab friend. And Chris says, but, but I'm not Arab. And Darwish said to him, we're all Arabs, but some of us don't know it. Um, and I, I thought, you know, what what uh, uh, what makes uh, there's a there's a lot to unpack in in that uh, witticism, uh, which I think is much more than witticism. Uh, and I think of uh, uh, Ital, who is, as she wrote in her introduction to, in the heart of the heart of another country to be an Arab and a non-Arab at the same time. Um, and also, you know, to, to ask oneself, especially in, in, in the Anglophone American empire, what does it, who is an Arab? And uh, maybe perhaps to answer simply and say, really anyone who wants to be, because historically it hasn't just been about language and certainly hasn't been about a purity of race or ethnicity or any such thing. It has been quite fluid. So if Etel wanted, as she did, to be an Arab, sometimes and sometimes not, um, we uh, always loved her for it as Arabs. And we were honored by what she gave us. The other thought I had was with my beautiful friend, Julian Haji, the uh, Syrian Kurd, who met Etel several times in, in Paris, along with Marilyn Hacker. Um, he, he said to me, he said, you know, Etel was lucky she, she got to live in a way two lives. She lived productively to a, to a, a good age. And you get to see the beauty uh, through which she moved from a sense of unquestionable commitment to, uh, to, to love uh, in, the, in the political sense, uh, to just in the end uh, liberate herself and just be Ital Adnan. A, a lucky thing, I think, for any of us uh, to experience, at least something I dream of, to get to a point in life where I just get to be me. Uh, if I ever figured that out. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been thinking uh, a lot also about your, uh, what you said in your beautiful uh, talk. And, you know, I've been thinking, why, why did Etel suddenly become a worldwide phenomenon, especially in the Western world, in her 80s, as an artist and not as a writer? I don't know that I have answers. Um, uh, but I'd like to be provocative and pretend that I do. And why, for example, if she influenced so many people in American poetics, uh, what, what happened to her colleagues, American colleagues who are an experimental writers or whatever expression we want to give, uh, it, you know, in relation to what attention did they get that she did not get? And one wonders why. Uh, 
there are, I am sure there is no one single answer for this. Why is, personally, I'm, I think Marie Sit, uh, Sit Marie Rose is a, you know, one of her earlier works. She'd written much, much better works since then. But there's something fascinating about the way that novel gets picked up repeatedly. I always find fascinating also that her um, sort of, claim, you know, her, her, her rise to prominence comes on the heels of a book called The Arab Apocalypse. Uh, and that's what gets referred to again and again. Nothing, not much else of her other um, works in the general public. Those of us who read her uh, deeply uh, and carefully have, have obviously more, I would say, genuine opinions. Um, and, and those who bring up the Arab apocalypse, who of them really know about Tel Zatar and what that means? Who of them know about the literature of Tel Zatar, the aesthetic, the art, the songs in the Arab world and the poems that also uh, form a, um, a catalog, perhaps, of, of that event and, and how it extends into time. Not necessarily as this just, you know, it's not just about the, the massacre of Tel Zatar, but the, the, the Palestinian. Uh, Fawaz Trabulsi, the, the um, Lebanese intellectual, insists that Ital Adnan was the first to include the concept of indigeneity uh, of the Native American here in parallel to the Palestinian in the Arab world, you know, to bring that to, because he says she did it so in the 80s or so. I don't know about the historical accuracy of that, but I'm quite okay <laughs> with that belonging to Ital. Um, and uh, I also, um, uh, the day she died, um, strangely, uh, thought of Khalil, Jibran Khalil Jibran. And I thought of this kind of construction that goes on in, in the world, in the Anglophone world, where Ital Adnan was born seven or eight years before Gibran died in 31. And I began to kind of form this parallel between a century almost, between two Arab poet philosophers, prose stylists, and artists. And Gibran died when uh, Ital Adnan, as the great artist she, she is and was, um, was born. Uh, he died when he was almost 50 or so, I can't remember. Uh, and that's when Ital, when Ital just you know, exploded onto the world. So it's almost as if there is this poetic, uh, cosmic continuation between the two. But there's also this notion of the times that have changed that would allow us here in, in you know, the imperial world to, to pick up on, Amer on, on Etel and, and decide to celebrate her in the name of um, art or love or wisdom or so forth, or even political commitment. Whereas we know to this very day that Gibran will continue to be ridiculed um, for much of uh, the psyche uh, within the psyche, or or in you know, there's a huge of, of American psyche, or we have a great indifference to Gibran, um, and even the literature, the biographies, some of them by Arab Americans. There's this uh, amazing kind of uh, wave to ride to kind of uh, dismiss Gibran as this, that, and the other. I, I won't go into that, but I, but all these thoughts made me think of, well, we need to kind of maybe think of the moment that we find ourselves in and, we, and, Itel, and, and the moment that found Etel also, found Etel in English. Uh, and yes, we are all grateful that she is thankfully larger than that moment and will outlast it. Um, I would like to read from In the Heart of the Heart of Another Country from the last chapter to be in a time of war. And what I did was um, that I spliced the chapter into a poem, no words of mine, but I, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, for those, I think this is like a, a, one of the best 
uh, pieces of writing uh, I could think of on what it means uh, uh, to know that there is so much suffering in the world, so much destruction, and to, in a strange way to be part of it. One can argue that it's almost like this uh, uh, democratic imperial notion of solidarity, uh, because you know this is really the silent and non-silent majority that Etel and myself and many of us perhaps here belong to when she speaks. When, when the war in Iraq, when the destruction of Iraq, uh, our destruction of Iraq, um, invoked that in her yet again, every time she wanted to walk away from that and live her synesthesia. You know, here's a person who uh, was gifted with seeing the world in colors and, uh, um, but to be in a time of war. To say nothing, do nothing, mark time, to bend, to straighten up, to blame oneself, to stand, to go toward the window, to hear a war from far away for others, to bomb, eliminate a country, blow up a civilization, destroy the living, to exit from one idea to enter another, to admire the light, bless the spring, to consider the present time as sheer lead, to create terror, that's war. To wallow in cruelty, conquest, to burn, to kill, to torture, to humiliate, that's war again and again. To welcome the sun, to water the plants, to roll back the hose. To affirm love, look through the void, measure its depth, to wonder if it is permissible that some eat bio foods while others die of hunger. To intimately know how ferociously invading armies ate. To extinguish the light in the eyes of those who love the world, to threaten life itself, to impose death, that's war. To dream of deserts, to count the cactuses and all venomous plants, to read the map of the sky, to mark out the stars, to spot Pleiades, to remember Babylon, to put an end to a long day, to go to sleep, to lie, to admit that the weather is noncommittal beautifully, to make coffee, to pour it but forget to drink it, to drink it cool down, throw out the rest, to get upset. To say the hell with it, the hell with it. To wait for the mail while thinking, who cares? To go to the dentist early in the morning, then drive back and come home to vomit the war. To find tenderness in stones. To witness the execution of. To distill thoughts like one does alcohol, a drop at a time. To remember green plantations, red earth, black faces, white tears, to breathe with difficulty, to not worry but be bored, to reach a state of parallel awareness, to go to the window just to make sure that it's very sad outside, just like in Under the Bombs, to listen to a clarinet player, to hear the pounding of in the music's tissue, to keep to come back totally to the music, to find it barbaric, ecstatic, to order salad with smoked salmon, to pour oil and vinegar, to call the waitress who comes and pours coffee, to hallucinate, to see the amputated like vases set on shelves, to still love those one has loved, to discover that one has really loved, to not underestimate mathematical functions, to expect them to reestablish some direction for thinking, for exploding dormant certitudes, to transform matter into spirit, to cross the threshold, to abolish all signs, then go after them, to decode the future, to rust, 
to encapsulate the present, to be agitated in order not to be more restless, to give way to the body's floodgates, to observe intensely the picture of corpses lying on their land, to return to those images and transform them into icons, to pray, to start a gray day, to lose the limit between the self and its environment, buy two newspapers to double the horror, to climb mountains, but it's not true, to be glued to the ground, to bury the living dead, to lower one's mask, to clean the bathtub with disgust, to lift the great song again, to rest has become useless, to prevent light from, from reaching the spirit, to warm one's resentment, to ask death to be accountable, to define sadness and dissect it in an anatomy course, to catch the flu, to destroy both the inner and the outer wall, to see the sun go down and leave a band of light over the river, to understand suddenly with the suddenness of this same light that time came out from the triangular confrontation of a place already visited, to keep a distance from desire, to keep a benevolent look, to complain about noise, to feel pain, to bury love, to spit bitterness, to brush one's teeth, to be sure that the day will look like yesterday to remember the different wars that wove one's life, to take a pill, to resent the new barbarians, to explore new diseases, to push aside fear, to draw back the curtains, to notice the mirrors shine during the night and that the mail is waiting to be answered, to already think of the next war, to drive through a green light to try to be distracted by poetry, by trees, to take refuge from bestial conquest in false shelters, to chase the refugee, to flush him out of his new refuge. So in that chapter, which is obviously about 15 more pages longer than this, is, is all of it tell, I find. I'd like to finish, and I, I feel like I, usually I was, was telling Zena that I don't take long, but I have taken long. I'd like to finish just by reading a poem of mine that I did not know when I wrote it, that I wrote it for Etel, and then I realized after I was done with it that I wrote it for Etel, and this was a couple of months before she died. Stick figures. The petals were phone number tags of an ad for a roommate on the bulletin board in the department's hallway. The petals were between yes and no. The tags were bangs, bumper stickers, sticky labels, tear-off tear strips for runways during wars. Everyone loves a winner. I will be loved by a few. They will be forgotten, as I will be forgotten. The petals belong to my people who, like any other people, are incapable of, or capable of, given time, the great provider. I sketch horror like children draw stick figures. I distill the body in mass graves. Sticks and bones may break my heart of stone, but a heart of stone pays no mind, and a heart of water has let the mind go. According to the testimonies, the trees were leafing through documents. The birds had transferred for a better education. The petals were corpses that made a bridge, corpses that turned a river red, a river ink. The petals had names. Ordinary citizen turned beast. Ordinary citizen, period. Majority souls silent and silenced. 
the tree next door for lynching, the tree that palms a scoop from the river, whales we guide to suicide, a willow sounding the barrier reef. Say, when will the madness end? I asked the petals, but they were between yes and no. The children headed there between yes and no and did the asking themselves. The petals answered or kept to themselves. The petals spoke only to bees and such. It spoke to us, the children clarified, through bees and such. And what did the bees and such hear, I asked. We did not have their ears, the children replied, and added that there were also ants around. The ants told the worms to tell the birds to bounce back. The petals were grackles in a football field on a middle school morning. The fog told the grackles the worms were looking for roommates. The petals ate the worms. The tags wore big toes in rows of yes and rows of no. The petals kept my toes warm. Thank you.